Greetings, I'm Demonac. Between episodes, extras, and YouTube comments, I've probably said most of this stuff at least twice, but hardly anyone sees all the comments, even those of you who are searching actively for every bit of extra info, so I'll try to bring it all together in this video while expanding the lore. This is the basics on Kuatoa monitors. There's a very long tradition of Kuatoa, the official spelling, Kuo with an O in Dungeons and Dragons, and for as long as I can remember there have existed a small percentage of KTs who become monks and are called monitors, which is interesting, but the KTs were generally a minor power and monks tend to be pretty weak. In the setting of Tales from My D&D Campaign, the Kuotoa, my version Kuo with an A, monitors exist, but they are far more than normal D&D monks. They are spies, operatives, and enforcers of a monumental empire known as terrifying assassins and army slayers. They can appear seemingly anywhere, and the deadliest of them is the supernatural, if not monstrous, powers. They are said to be kept at bay only by the fear and the fact that they are needed to counter their counterparts on the other side of the 300-year Kuotoa Civil War. If you care about game rules and stuff, I put out the details of my version of the Monitor Prestige class. You can find it on my occasionally used Tumblr at a link that I'll include. In fact, there are two versions. One version, which is intended to be balanced compared to other Tome of Battle, aka Book of Nine Swords classes. If, for some reason, a player character was going to use the Monitor Prestige class, this would be the one. A little strong, but presumably they would be saddled with the ECL and monstrous hit dice of Akua Toa, which are not a good deal for a PC. But I really just made that as a baseline so that the core abilities would be comparable to other classes or prestige classes. The second version uh, is the monster version of that, which makes them tremendously powerful, as you would expect for an enemy intended to be a threat even when outnumbered by player characters. They have loads of bonus feats, max d12 hit dice, and their unarmed attacks improve with magic weapon enhancements and abilities as they level up. Now, from a 3.5 game design perspective, I probably should have made it a template rather than making a class not intended for PCs, but I really prefer building NPCs with character levels, and in particular, it gives me the freedom to min-max them further, as much for coolness as for power, often by multi-classing the shit out of them. The prestige class is so strong, they would usually be better off devoting themselves to it, but multiclassing helps make them each unique and interesting killing machines. There is a long tradition of training monitors in locations spread throughout the expansive Diluvian Empire. The fact that two of the five monasteries fell into Illud hands when the Empire split was not a coincidence. Without them, the rebellion would never have been possible. They wouldn't even have tried. It was so critical that they needed to bring in surface dwellers, two legends of modern history, the elven wizard Madrigal and the young but already renowned halfling scion Crystalfoot to secretly work with Godfin Mulek, head of the Thundershore Monastery, to ensure that the monitors of Thundershore and of Mako Ridge would back the rebel council and to root out from among them any loyalists who would betray Elude for the Empire. Diamond Reef is one of the first two institutions where monitors' arts were discovered and developed. The Diamond Fin monitors aspire to achieve absolute physical perfection. It is claimed that in battle, their Death Fin monitors take conscious control of their every autonomic function, every breath, every heartbeat, timed to optimize performance, and, if needed, every muscle in their body working consciously to aid the movements needed to avoid a lethal blow or to destroy an enemy. Diamond Fins are the least likely to use spell casting in combat. They believe the greatest expression of mental power is the strength of will to master oneself, although that focus does sometimes translate into low-level psionic warrior powers to enhance their physical prowess. It was at the Diamond Reef where the infamous death fin ritual of Lugo Kua, removing the webbing from their hands and feet, was first practiced, because, it is said, the leader of the monastery was so frustrated by the wind and water resistance he felt, even though to any observer his strikes were already supernaturally quick and precise. Sons of Baal is actually the name of the monastic order more than their ancient location, which they call Kushno Baal. You might translate it as God's weapon rack. Also one of the two earliest monasteries, 
Whether they or Diamond Reef were first is a matter of great and likely unanswerable historical debate. The Sons of Baal are by far the most religious of the warrior monk organizations, and in the empire's theocratic government, they have the most political connections as well. Since the beginning of their civilization, Kuatoa have believed that each of them carries within them a divine spark, a trace of the blood of their god, Blabal, which she gifted to their ancestors to help them turn the seas red with victorious conquest. The Sons of Baal select prospective members on the basis of the purity of their blood, claiming they can identify individuals within whom the god's blood is abnormally strong, and those who survive the training to enter their ranks take the title of Thin Lord, focusing on developing supernatural abilities derived, supposedly, from their divine blood. Thin Lords are renowned for exhibiting bizarre freak powers on the battlefield, to a degree normally only death fins can achieve in other monitor orders. Blood Mountain is the ancient Diluvian monastery best known for the melding of magic and martial arts. The blood fins are kung fu wizards, occasionally derided by other monitors for being weaker in pure physical combat, but that criticism is utterly academic. Blood fins use magic to enhance their speed, strength, and defense, but also use spells to destroy or cripple foes at range, to counter enemy magic, to gain information and mobility to accomplish their missions. It is recorded that in ancient times, a warrior called Ranargul arrived at Blood Mountain and challenged one of their greatest monitors to battle. Ranargul engaged the monitor, casting haste to accelerate his own movements and weakening his opponent with a curse which increased in power as the fight went on. Bloodfin Krotoro managed to defeat Ranargul, but when the stranger yielded and removed his curse, Krotoro spared him, shocked by the potential he had seen. Renar Ghoul's fighting skills were unrefined. It turned out he'd been rejected by one of the other monasteries and had virtually no monitor training. Yet, despite this, his magic had allowed him to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with a powerful warrior. Krotoro convinced the elders to train Renar Ghoul, and as they saw the potential power of combining their style with sorcery, he began to teach them what would soon become the signature Uren style of the Bloodfins. Krotoro, and later Renar Ghoul himself in turn, each went on to become Godfin of Blood Mountain, the two of them leaving a permanent mark on the monastery. Thundershore is a monastery located partially on the landmass known, since the Elude Schism, as the Elude Highlands. The Stormfins have a tradition of even greater openness to new techniques than the Bloodfins, an openness which may explain why their leader at the time of the Schism, Godfin Mulek, listened to and was eventually convinced by the reasoning of the Elude rebels. Like the other Elude monastery, Thundershore has been given massive resources to help them, insofar as possible, to expand their order, in order to compete with the number of monitors still loyal to the Empire. Diluvian monitors and public propaganda would lead you to believe this expansion has reduced the quality of Stormfin monitors, but there seems little evidence to support this. Oru, the fictional protagonist of the Hero Tale propaganda comics, was a Stormfin, and while the comic book's portrayal of Deathfin Unon appears to be based on no actual evidence, Oru's sand form technique is a signature move taught at Thundershore. Mako Ridge is the other monastery in the Eastern Empire which sided with the rebels in the KT Civil War, and it was the last of the five monasteries to be founded. From their secluded location near a deep ocean rift, in an area revered by the ancient Sahagwan, surrounded most of the year by the large population of sharks from which they get their name, the Makofin monitors study and practice psionic powers, and they claim they can see perfectly through clouds of blood so common in undersea warfare. According to legend, their founder first discovered the mental powers by studying the inferior Sahagwan race's telepathic control of sharks though the monitors have moved far, far beyond that, allowing them to heal wounds, modify their own bodies in various ways, or even to see split seconds into the future to dodge attacks. They also pioneered many of the psionic abilities which were later taken on by the Elude version of the KT agents known as Slave Hunters, less powerful than monitors but still feared domestically. There were two other orders of Diluvian monitors which arose in the ancient era but which no longer exist. The seldom-remembered Silverfin order arose and faded, never having reached the level of skill, lethality, and success of the monitors we know today. The Shadowfins of the Southern Abyss Monastery 
are remembered, as they grew so powerful and pretentious that their leader, Godfin Choiseul, decided that only he was worthy to be emperor and to rule and slaughter in the name of Blabal. The Shadowfin heresy was arguably the greatest threat to the Deluvian Empire prior to the Illud betrayal, and it is said that Godfin Choiseul was perhaps the deadliest monitor ever prior to the two ultimate monitors, Deathvin Du and Deathvin Unan, who have arisen in modern times. This was prior to the founding of Mako Ridge, and it took the combined might of the other four orders to destroy Shuazul and stop the Shadowfins, who, at their peak, claimed almost a quarter of the undersea area of the Empire. Although the Shadowfin monitors were hunted down and exterminated, many techniques and principles of Renjul, the brutal kickboxing arts they had devised, were incorporated by the survivors of the other orders, particularly by the open-minded Stormfins, and by the Diamond Fins, who appreciated the sheer kinetic efficiency of their style. Ren Jewel of the Nine Weapons focused on making the deadliest use of knees, elbows, and bite attacks, though most monitors consider reliance on their teeth as a sign of weakness, of lacking skill or discipline. In that big block of history, you heard a lot of different monitor titles, but there are only three proper ranks of monitor. Thin monitors, monitors in training, don't go on missions. You don't hear much about them. The name rank is a generalized descriptor of the rank of true monitors, the ones that are feared throughout the ocean and the surface world. The confusion arises from the fact that each monastery has their own unique name for this rank. Diamond Fins are from Diamond Reef, the Blood Fins of Blood Mountain, the Fin Lords are the Sons of Baal, Stormfin, the monitor from Thundershore, and Makofin, obviously from Mako Ridge. There were also the Silverfin from the defunct Endless Shoal Monastery, and of course the Shadowfin monitors from the Southern Abyss. Finally, there's Deathfin, the deadliest monitors from any monastery. The other title you've heard is Godfin, which is not really a separate rank. It's actually just an honorific for the head of a monastery who is always a Deathfin monitor, but Godfins are chosen by their predecessor or by a council of Deathfins for their teaching or administrative skills. Because of this, the Godfin is usually not the deadliest monitor of their order, though there have been some exceptions, most notably the infamous Shadowfin leader, Godfin Shuazul. However, just for extra confusion, the title Godfin has become so commonly misused among the KT population to describe Deathvin Du and Deathvin Unon that it has almost become a valid second meaning, making it easy to mistake it for an actual fourth rank above Deathvin. How to be a monitor. Some of the monitors have additional specialized criteria, but for the most part they get a combination of volunteers, KT who want to be monitors and think they are strong or tough or smart enough to do it, and individuals they select from among the populace. Each order has a few individuals who may or may not be monitors themselves, who follow rumors and recommendations and roam the nation, or at least the areas near their monastery, acting as a sort of talent scouts. It is well known that the success rate of volunteers is abysmal compared to those individuals conscripted by the monks themselves but no monastery has been willing to shut out volunteers because they each have stories of some of their greatest warriors coming from among the self-selected. Monasteries differ in how often they hold this process. The Sons of Baal famously accept only one set of recruits every second year on the date of the Day of the Divine Gift, and even that is a concession to the requirements of wartime. Prior to the Civil War, they accepted recruits only once per decade when the Day of the Divine Gift Ceremony is celebrated in the Imperial Capital. By contrast, most monasteries take in a new class once or twice per year, and Thundershore admits new potential monitors essentially all year round. Now, once you volunteer or are chosen to attend, you are subjected to a sort of boot camp where the weak are weeded out, followed by a series of increasingly challenging tests. The success rate for admittance is very low, but the rate of permanent injury or death among the supplicants is relatively low, as most are eliminated before the last couple of dangerous challenges. 
if you succeed in proving your will and your metal and whatever else, such as the ritual used by the sons of Baal to assess the strength of your divine blood, you are anointed a thin monitor. As previously noted, monitors of thin rank are just trainees, but they begin a period of rigorous physical and mental training combined with instruction in those martial arts and possibly mystical arts favored by that particular order. For example, Bloodfins will have to master, at minimum, several first-level arcane spells. This stage can take many years. For example, Mako Ridge Fins enter the Monitor Trials after six years, though most orders judge readiness purely on the individual's level of mastery. Diamond Fins often take a perverse pride in the length of time spent honing their body as a fin, telling how some of their greatest death fins remained at the fin rank for almost two decades. Though, in practice, the instructors are unlikely to put up with such a slow pace. It is common for fins to give up and quit, or to be expelled for their failures, as the path to becoming a monitor is a difficult one. When you are deemed ready, you must pass the monitor trials. These tests and challenges differ wildly between monasteries, and while some must be completed back to back over a grueling period of days or weeks, others are taken at a deliberate pace, such as the five trials of Thundershore each taken on the first day of a successive month, with the remainder of the month in between to prepare for the next one. Once a fin begins the trials, though, they receive no more help or instruction unless and until they succeed. The monitor trials are sink or swim and have a high rate of fatalities. Failure often equates to death, because success means induction into the order as a full mission-ready monitor. Instructors rarely take much interest or get attached to fins because they know most will not survive. Once you become a full monitor, whether a diamond fin, fin lord, whatever, you become a full member of the order, gaining access to many resources of the monastery, including a selection of magic items and assistance in learning some of that monastery's advanced techniques. But from day one, a name rank monitor can be called upon at a moment's notice to complete a mission. Missions are given out by the Godfin, the head of the order, at their own discretion. So, when an order comes down from the Emperor or from the Illu Council, the Godfin chooses which monitor will be assigned the mission. Further, Godfins give out their own missions, ranging from basic recruiting and instructing to the politically dicey idea of actual kill or retrieve missions sanctioned independent of the government. Anyhow, after many years, many missions, and many victories, as a successful veteran monitor, you may seek to attain the greatest recognition available to a monitor by completing the Deathfin Trials. These trials have a very low level of fatalities compared to the lethal trials that Finns undergo. This is important because, unlike a mere Finn, a true monitor is an extremely valuable asset on a national level, far too valuable to throw away simply because you failed to make Deathfin rank. So, you do not have to kill another Deathfin to become one, that would be silly. But while few monitors die attempting the Deathfin trials, the success rate is also very low. And further, if you fail the trial, you must wait at least 10 years before trying again. The trial for each Deathfin supplicant is highly individual, as the Godfin, or another Deathfin, delegated by the Godfin, first tests, observes, and assesses you, and then assigns you several tests, each designed to hone in on one of your greatest weaknesses. Often these trials are actual missions, where, for example, a monitor who focused on his deadly palm strikes might be required to complete the entire task without using his hands. Or there's the dreaded and almost cliché Blood Mountain trial of completing a mission without casting a single spell. Again, the prospective Deathfin is unlikely to die, even with such limitations, because if you really get into trouble, you should have the wisdom to abandon the trial and simply do what it takes to win. For challenges like this, another monitor would typically be observing you to ensure compliance, though the Bloodfins never send observers, instead using an abjuration or divination which would tell them if the rules of the trial were broken. If you pass the Deathfin trials assigned to you, then you have shown that even your greatest weaknesses cannot stop you from completing your missions. You are a well-rounded killing machine, a grandmaster of multiple martial arts, and a nigh-unstoppable force. You will now undergo the Lugo Kua, a ritual whose details vary somewhat between the monastic orders, but ultimately 
the webbing between your fingers and toes will be removed in a slow and painful process which leaves no scar tissue. Whether or not the hydro and aerodynamic benefits are as noticeable as the deafness claim, your skeletal looking hands now signify that you are a walking incarnation of death. More importantly, as a deathman you are granted access to the greatest secrets of your order. Each monastery has accumulated a collection of deadly abilities, the instructions for which are recorded on dusty scrolls or passed down orally from your master, the Godfin. These secret techniques are not shared with ordinary monitors because they are incredibly difficult and in many cases dangerous to learn or to use. But if, through study and hard work, you find even one or two which you are able to manifest, you can achieve utterly unnatural feats of magic, psionic, or martial power. For each ancient scroll you read, you are aware that more than one monitor has ruptured an organ or channeled too much of their own life force and died attempting this spell or maneuver. But that also tells you the level of power that can be unlocked if you can find even one that suits your style or temperament. I've mentioned before that I'm no fan of the alignment system. It's a necessary evil in order to have some system for saying this guy can wield the holy sword, and this monster is burned by the holy sword. So while alignment is really an individual, mutable, and subjective thing, it still remains as a shorthand for a character's morals, at least until you actually get to know them. And I have seen a bunch of you ask about the alignment of monitors, with questions I would generalize as something like, how evil are they? Are they chaotic or lawful? And are any of them not chaotic evil? So. Being individuals, and monitors in particular, are very individual. There are a spectrum of different alignments among them. The most common alignment is lawful because of the rigid, structured monastic culture and another level of overarching order. The very strong tradition that monitors get their orders from the emperor, or on the elite side the council, and they always faithfully and successfully execute those missions. On the other alignment axis, many if not most monitors, are indeed evil, though there are also a great many who are more neutral and even a number who are lawful good, particularly on the Illu side. But that is not to say that the ideals and morals of an LG Illu monitor would be agreeable or even understandable to an elf or dwarf or human. Certainly, many of them believe in the necessity, if not the righteousness, of the institution of slavery. Good aligned Diluvian monitors would be even more unrecognizable to us in their beliefs, and at the same time, they would have to hide their thoughts and feelings on many issues to continue to serve. Compared to traditional D&D monks who are forced to be lawful, I tend to ignore those kinds of stupid alignment restrictions on classes for both PCs and NPCs, a surprising number of monitors on both sides are in fact chaotic. It may even be more common than being neutral on the law versus chaos axis. Certainly, chaotic monitors have to compromise or conceal their anarchic or anti-authoritarian streak, but a common theme in Kuotoan literature, and one which holds pretty true to reality, is that monitors follow their orders to the letter and warp the slightest vagueness or ambiguity to exercise their own whim or bloodlust. In fact, this trope is so strong that it seems oftentimes that some aspects of their missions are left intentionally ambiguous by their political masters. The thought being that by allowing the deadly agents that freedom, that feeling of autonomy and of twisting the intentions, that they may be more likely to follow the clearest and most critical parts of their orders when it really matters. There is a real tension, a real game between those who give orders and those who follow them. Monitors seem nearly omnipotent physically, but are expected to be completely bound and controlled by their leaders, each side second-guessing the other. Keeps life interesting. As mentioned earlier, the so-called ultimate monitors, Du on the Diluvian side and Unon of the Illud, are often referred to as the Godfins, but that title is wholly inaccurate. Neither of them is head of a monastery. Each of them is actually a deathfin, as there is no rank of monitor above that, though the public can be forgiven for misusing Godfin to describe them that way, since if there was a rank above Deathfin, they would deserve it. The many tales written of their capabilities or of hypothetical confrontation between them 
are just fiction, most with no actual basis in evidence. Reportedly, the Ilud Council wanted a demonstration of at least some of Unan's capabilities, and whatever he showed them, they came away with the impression that if Unan were to betray them, the only way to stop him would be to gather all of their monitors together, and even that, even if it were practical, might not be enough. Fortunately, as you've heard more than once, each side is too afraid to actually use their ultimate monitor for fear of what the enemy one could do. The main calculation is that if the Illud sent Deathvin Unon to destroy the Deluvian capital, or vice versa, that Deathvin Du would be there to stop him, resulting in a confrontation where no one could reliably predict the result. They just don't have the information on either Grandmaster's capabilities relative to the other. That means you might win, in which case your side would almost certainly conquer the entire ocean and be positioned as the greatest power in the Fadelands. But it also means you might lose, which would almost certainly mean the end of your nation and the extermination of you and everyone you know or care about. Would you make that gamble without a clue what the odds are? Only if you were very desperate. So the direct approach doesn't make sense, unless you have essentially lost the war already. Now, high-level wizards and eldritch eyes are both hard to come by, but both the Illud and the Deluvians are reported to have a fully teleport-capable spellcaster stationed with their Grandmaster at all times, meaning that, like an intercontinental ballistic missile, they could reach any spot on the plane within approximately one minute. Despite that capability, you don't want to send them against another target because if the enemy realizes your weapon is away, they can teleport their own ultimate monitor to take out your capital before yours can teleport back, which may leave their capital open to counterattack. So maybe both governments are destroyed, and pretty soon the fate of both nations is back to resting on the unpredictable result of the epic duel. I put this video out early to my Patreon patrons for feedback so I could, so I could answer a couple of questions. I think the questions that fit best for this video were a couple from Warsaw, who asked, Has a monitor ever trained under multiple monasteries? Is this an established taboo, or has no one ever tried this? And, all the monitors so far have been pure-blood Kuotoa, but has one of the ogre-sized Kuotoa ever become a monitor? Well, monasteries on the same side of the Civil War rarely actively struggle with each other, but they are competitive enough that they do not share secrets. So a monitor trained at one, then training at another, is the kind of thing that happens in their fiction, makes for some interesting plots, generally not for real, but I can't say it never happened. Renar Ghoul, mentioned above, was arguably an example of this, depending on how early he was kicked out of his first monastery before becoming a founder of Blood Mountain's signature combat style. In the Deluvian Empire, House Babago, the fish ogres, just could not become monitors. They were always looked down on as dim-witted, and they aren't super agile. Prejudice like that is why they sided with the Illud rebels, pretty strongly. So on the Illud side, they are not barred from becoming monitors, but many of the tests are near impossible for them because of the dexterity required, or because their size gets in the way. Again, it's something that could happen, though it'd have to be pretty rare. I want to give a big thanks to all my generous Patreon patrons who got to watch this video first and had a chance to give feedback on any topics I might have missed so I might include them in the final video. I'm going to try and do this pre-release with extras and basics videos from now on, though the videos will always be free a short time later and the main content videos will always go out at the same time on YouTube for everyone. I don't have a lot of rewards yet, though I'm working on it. But if you want to support my channel directly, you can chip in at patreon.com slash demonac. And if you can't afford to, or just don't feel like it, remember, it doesn't cost you a dime to like and share tales from my D&D campaign.